Hi, Roy. Michael. Um, welcome in on Saturday. Um, same squad, or is there any fresh injuries? Um, MacArthur obviously was injured for that game, and unfortunately, we did pick up a couple of, of quite serious knocks in the game. So at this moment in time, I've got a couple of other players that we're going to have to really, really look at and, and assess whether they can make it tomorrow. And then there's the usual suspects. So the the injury situation for us at the moment is not good. Um, Newcastle next. Obviously, they won as well on Saturday. A tough game, but is this the season where anyone could beat anyone? Yeah, I think in, in the position you know where we find ourselves, the teams around us, it, it's often quite close games and, and fairly small small margins, which will decide whether you come away with the three points or even worse, none at all. So it's quite difficult to predict games, I think, sometimes around the area where we are, but it's becoming a little bit more noticeable now that the very top teams, the ones we believe are possibly going to be championship contenders, they, they don't seem to be slipping up very often anymore. And one or two teams like Arsenal and Chelsea, we expect them also to be kicking on, so I, I think that they'll be winning their matches. Mm. Obviously, deadline day today. You've already brought in Jean-Philippe Mateta. You've, you've mentioned a few injuries. Is, is there any any word of any incomings today? No, because I mean, the, unfortunately, when you play matches so so close together, you do pick up injuries. You do pick up knocks, which don't recover in the three days that you've got at your disposal. So it's a fairly common occurrence, and you, you can't go out signing new players every time. We have a a squad of players which is more than capable, I think, of seeing us through the season. Unfortunately, there'll be moments like the one we're in now where you have to uh, accept that you don't have your full complement of players. There's been interesting Christian Benteke all, all month. Will he be staying with you? Will he be travelling up to Newcastle? Yes, he's travelling up to Newcastle, yes. I've heard nothing to the contrary on that. I mean, there's a speculation about a lot of players all the time, but... Uh, um, Christian and I know exactly where we stand with each other, that's for sure, and I'm I'm happy that he's staying with us. And one I read last night, Roy, that really out of the blue, Patrick van Arnholt, Arsenal. Is there, is there anything in that? Not that I know. No. no. I um, mean, if you say to me, is Patrick van Arnholt a good enough player to play at Arsenal? I say, yes, he is. But I mean, he's a good enough player to play at lots of clubs, not least of all our own. And this is where he's contracted, and this is where I'm expecting him to stay. So that would be a big surprise to you if you heard anything as you were travelling up? That would be a real surprise to me, yeah. We're not travelling up to today anyway, so uh, I'd know by tomorrow morning when we travel up. OK. Um, the good news, Vincenzo Guaita, I know you think a lot of him. and He signed a new contract. He seems to have a real bond with Crystal Palace and the supporters. I mean, it, that's a big... Although no transfers in today, keeping your best players is sometimes even better news as well at times, isn't it? Absolutely. No, Doug, Doug did the deal with Vicente some while ago. I can't remember exactly when, but it was some while ago. So I've always known that he's committed his future to the club and we're very pleased to have him. He's been very, very uh, consistent in his performances. He's made some very good saves during the time he's been with us and he seems to be enjoying his time here. So I was a little bit taken aback at a press conference after the game when someone suggested to me he signed a free contract because... As far as I knew, he was contracted to us. Um, finally, from me, I mean, there's a number of players who are out of contract in the summer. Do you think we could expect maybe some announcements with renewals of contracts over the next few weeks and months? Yes, I would think so. I mean, it's something which obviously occupies not only the time, but the thoughts of the people at the you know, hierarchy of the club and, and Doug Friedman working with Steve Paris. They're constantly assessing and talking about these things. So I would be expecting them to be making some decisions regarding these players and confronting me sometimes with the decisions that they have in mind. Thanks, Roy. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. We'll move on to Katie Cassidy of PLP. Hi there, Roy. Nice to speak to you this Thank afternoon. You. Thank you. So, um, Just touching back again on Vincente, Vincente's um, extension this morning, we had some interview time with him earlier and he said how at home and settled he feels at the club you have also spoken quite recently out of how content you are with your players and you don't obviously expect a frantic deadline day. Is that something that you and the club are quite proud of, providing a place where players seem very happy? 
That's a good question. I've you know, not really thought about it in those terms, but uh, I think it probably is a, a source of pride for the club. You know, certainly the people who own the club and the people who are charged with the day-to-day -day running of it, away from my particular part, which is just working with the players and the team, I think it probably is a source of pride. It's a good point. You know, it's, it's nice to know that when you sign players and you, you can keep them more satisfied enough to want to stay with you and they're not looking immediately to always move on. And, you know, since I've been at the club, it's you know, coming up to the end of the fourth season. It's been a very stable group of players and, and very many of those players have, have done a good job for the club even before that too. So we, we, we have a good bunch like that and... Um, it's not something I've actually thought about in terms of taking pride, but I think if I was Steve Parrish and the owners of the club, I'd take some pride in that. That's good to hear. Um, you mentioned updates to tomorrow's lineup due to the injuries. Could we potentially see Mateta make a start tomorrow night? Yes, potentially. He's ready, fit and ready to play. Um, in fact, we've got good options in the centre-forward area at the moment because the players who are available to us in that area, all fit and all ready to play. So we're, we're very happy with him. He seems to be getting more and more attuned to, to life in England and life in the Premiership, and in particular life in South East London with us. So all those, all those elements point to the future we're hoping for for him. Very good. Um, focusing on um, the Newcastle game, obviously we saw you adapting formations against Wolves and you said after the match that you wouldn't necessarily rule out that way of playing as it showed potential. Can we see you readjusting or implementing anything against Newcastle? We're always adjusting, really. I mean, sometimes the adjustments are sufficiently minute or sufficiently subtle and not to, not to hit people bang in the eye and I'm not even certain that if I hadn't spoken about it people would have noticed any change on, on Saturday either but we're always thinking about the opposition we're always thinking about what's best for our players the ones we're putting on the field of play what positions suit them best where they can give their best performances but uh, everything is is based around very clear principles you know how we how we want to attack and what we want to do with the ball and what we want to do when we don't have the ball, how we want to defend. So those principles really are the holy grail and they don't change at all. But within that, with the type of players we have, we, we aren't 100% committed to one particular system. We can, we can make changes and I reserve the right to do so, A, for the personnel that are playing in a particular game and B, with a thought to the opposition. And what is to be expected from Newcastle? Obviously, they're off a great win at Everton. Um, they obviously changed their formation up a bit as well, which they've been trying to do successfully for a little while now. So are you expecting a real threat? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they've got some very good players. And Steve Bruce has been very unlucky during a period of time because very many of those good players that he obviously trusts and would like to see on the field have not been available to him. Now those players are coming back. And I'm looking at their squad today. and looking at the options they have, and they, they have a lot of options and a lot of quality players that they can turn to. So uh, I'm not at all surprised to see them play well at Everton and win the game. And we are expecting a very tough game up there tomorrow because that's what playing away from home and playing teams like Newcastle means to you. It's uh, never going to be an easy ride. And final question from me, obviously 13th in the table now, 26 points. You start looking about and another three points could see an even tighter position and finer margins. Do you think the guys will feel that pressure tomorrow night? I think the players at this level of football feel the pressure every game, especially if you've got competition for places. If you've got your place in the team, you, you feel some sort of pressure to, to keep your place in the team. And in terms of points and points needed, that's a constant pressure as well. It's nice that we don't have the enormous pressure that the teams currently in the bottom three are experiencing. So we're happy for that. But that doesn't remove the pressure for us either because we want to increase our points tally. And until we've got to a points tally that we think is going to be good enough to keep us in the league, we, we won't relax and we won't ever go into a game feeling there's no pressure on us today. Fantastic. Thank you, Murray. Thank you.
Thanks, Katie. We'll move to Alex Howell of BBC Sport. Hi, Roy. Alex. Um, I know you're not a massive fan of statistics, but that's uh, three clean sheets in the last five Premier League games. Does that show performances are moving in the right direction? Yeah, but we let in four at Man City, unfortunately. So that's that's ruined any any real desire. And then we let in, let in three against West Ham. So for me, I always juggle those things together. Yes, I'm happy with every clean sheet. Three, three out of five is is good. But the seven we let in two wasn't so good. And as a result, our goal difference is still very poor. Um, but we know that the goals that we've let in in particular games where we've really been beaten heavily. That's not been typical of the way we play or typical of our performance. And it's been something that's happened on the night, either because we've come across an opponent in incredible form or we maybe found ourselves on the back end of some incredible finishing. Um, I believe we're capable of, of, of playing matches and, and keeping clean sheets. And that's something we're going to need to continue to do for certain if we want to progress up the league and stay well away from the dreaded relegation threatened zone. And if I could just ask you about uh, the racial abuse some players have received on social media within the last week, um, do you think it's a case that the social media companies need to do more or Premier League need to give a bit more support to players when it does happen? Well, it's important. That's the first thing. It's, it's so difficult, I think, for rational and decent-minded human beings to understand you know what what would what would provoke someone to do that is is very difficult for me to come to terms with and i, I i'm 100 percent behind what uh, the duke of cambridge prince william said today i thought he expressed expressed everything perfectly if you like from a footballing point of view in, in his position as as paid to the, the football association I don't know what the answer is. I'm not a social media expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I would like to think that an answer can be found somewhere along the way. And in, in all of these questions that have been circulating for a while now about the racial abuse, I think we always come back to, to one crucial factor and that's education. You know, I can't imagine educated people are using social media to to send out vile messages to, to football players. But it needs to stop. Um, I don't know what else the Premier League can, and the, the PFA can do. I heard Bobby Barnes of the PFA speaking quite brilliantly on Radio 4 this morning about the situation. Everyone is so aware of the need to do something. And it seems to me more and more that within the game of football itself, our opinion about the subject is, is very clear and you know, no one is even suggesting otherwise that this is an abhorrent aspect in our society which affects us in football. So maybe it's got to be the social media companies who help us out in some way by finding a way of stopping this and police forces helping us find a way of making certain that people who do it are prosecuted because at the end of the day, if there's nothing on the end in terms of punishment you're going you're gonna to be feeling free to continue it until such time as A, it's not possible for you to do it or B, if you do it you face very strict punishment from the police authorities so that's what I'm hoping for but as I say it's purely a hope in, 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 in my instance I don't have an answer but like every right minded person of course I'm 100% behind everything that's going on. Thank you for that, Roy. That's it from me. Pleasure. Thanks, Alex. We'll move to Ian Abrahams from TalkSport. Thank you. Hi, Roy. How are you? I'm all right, Ian. Thank you. Fine. Um, unlike a lot of the people on this call, you and I are old enough to remember when it wasn't a transfer window or a transfer deadline day. You just went until, I think, the third Thursday in March signing players. Um, do you think we're better off, or do you think we're better off today? We have a Monday whereby you have this uncertainty over players, and then you have to go and play on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And you, you don't know if you're, you're still going to have those players available. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and it's a strange one. I mean, it's one I'd have to give more thought to. I do, of course, remember the time when transfer were available at any time up to that 
end of the season. In fact, I played football for one of the guys, Al Fackerman, who used to get transferred probably on about the 2nd of March every year to get a few goals for a team that either needed to get up the league or, or stay in the league. So that's that seems to be way, way in the distant past. It's a strange thing that so much activity does take place, I think, on, on the final day. I mean, people outside of football that I speak to, they, they find that hard to understand. You know, you've got a month to do any business you want to do in signing players or allowing players to leave. And it, at 11 o'clock at night, in the last hour of the transfer window, there's all sorts of a hectic chase around them. They don't understand it. I'm not fully certain I understand it either, if I'm to be brutally honest. But I wasn't against the transfer window idea when it came about, because I think it's worse in some ways, never knowing from week to week when that call is going to come through. And you don't know that the squad you're working with, the team you're working with and are happy with is suddenly going to be torn apart because someone covets one of your players and comes in and takes him from you. At least we know now that after that transfer deadline ends in the summer, we've got at least until January with this group of players. And then when January ends, we've got to the end of the season. So in principle, I'm not against transfer windows, um, but I, I do find it sometimes a little bit hard to understand why every bit of business seems to have to take place on the final day when you've had 30 days beforehand. Do you think the pandemic's affected the window? Because there do seem to be a lot less a lot, a lot less buying and selling this time around. There's certainly no enormous price tags, which I think would have gone down badly with the people outside of football maybe don't understand how the market works. No, I wouldn't want to get involved in that, but I mean, I, I do think your point is very well. I think the COVID virus crisis uh, has, has caused an enormous amount of damage, if you like, to the, to the football clubs. I think they've done ever so well to keep going and to, to shoulder the losses which not having any fans and losing some sponsorship money has caused. So to keep football going at a definite financial cost, they deserve uh, an awful lot of credit, as does the Premier League. So I'm not at all surprised that there isn't quite the same amount of money to go splashing out to, to improve your squad and bring in new players. I think everyone understands. You have to cut your cloth according to the size and... At the moment, our size is dictated by the fact that there's not such a lot of money to, to use. And that's why we're seeing more loans in order to, in some way, spread players around. And the amount of transfers that are taking place in this transfer window, where one raises an eyebrow and thinks that's a, that's a lot of money the club has spent there, we're not seeing it. And because of that, do we have to, someone like yourself, Ray Lewington, who rely on coaching, bringing through young players, actually making a player better. Is that, are we now going to see going forward, maybe in the next few years, that particular style of coaching rather than the, the manager that just goes and buys a ready-made team? I'm not going to name names on that. Well, I think the balance has always been there in, in, in that respect. And of course, uh, to survive in this league is so important financially for all the clubs and to be in the Champions League or the Europa League for certain others that have got ambitions to win the championship. I think there's always going to have to be a balance between making certain that you can achieve your objectives. And that might mean finding very good players playing in the country or abroad that you know when they come in will make a big difference. And, you know, we've seen plenty of examples of that in, in, in recent times. But I don't think that the Premiership clubs have in any way forgotten or been nonchalant about their own academies. We certainly aren't here. You know, we believe strongly that it's important that we do try to bring players through for two reasons. I mean, first of all, there isn't the obvious financial one. If you can find a player the quality you're looking for, it might mean you don't have to pay such a lot of money to replace him with someone from outside, but also in terms of the community as well. You know, I think I think supporters and people who support their clubs, they there's still a local feel, and I think they enjoy seeing someone who's committed his future to the club when he's been very young and has worked hard in his academy days to reach the first team. I think there's a, a lot of pride that supporters take in those players, and I would say, if anything, that we're producing more players 
from our academy and teams are using players from their academy much more today than they were certainly uh, 10 or 11 years ago when I came back to England from abroad. The final one, it's kind of in two parts. First, you and Newcastle, both well clear of the bottom three, so I wouldn't have said you've got anything majorly to worry about unless you think I'm wrong on that. And secondly, a month ago, we, we all said that anybody could win the league this year. It's wide open. Within the space of three weeks, Manchester City seems to have changed all that, and everyone says they, they're expected to go on and win it. How quickly football changes? Yeah, we know that. You said you've been in it a long time, and so we can both agree on that. But there's, there's been no doubt in my mind from, from the very start that Man City and Liverpool are two teams with incredible squads, incredible managers, incredible talent. Um, so I certainly wasn't one of the people who was going to line up and join that queue for the first time they lost a couple of games or the season didn't start exactly as they wanted to start crying. You know, they've got no chance anymore. For me, those two teams have always been the team to beat. But of course, the teams behind them are, are making a, a much stronger effort and have started so well that... I'm pretty certain that uh, it's easy for me to sit from a distance and not have to worry about Liverpool's result or Man City's result. Just take it for granted that they're probably going to win. But for Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola, I'm pretty certain they suffer the same sort of anxiety before games as I do with Crystal Palace. And it's by no means evident for them. Uh, but from my comfortable position, seeing them from afar, I did enjoying watching football. I, I think that for the teams behind them, they're, they're the ones to catch. And you'll have to work hard to catch them because they're both very, very good teams. Brilliant. Good luck, Roy. Good to see you again. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ian. OK, that concludes the broadcast section.